So welcome everybody to this month's Indigenous Stories program. My name is Laura Horwood Benton and I'm the Programming and Community Relations Librarian at Portsmouth Public Library in New Hampshire. Um, I already said that about audio and video. Before we get started, let me read our land acknowledgement. The city of Portsmouth is on the homelands of the Abenaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. According to tribal oral tradition, Abenaki people have lived in the place now called New Hampshire for more than 12,000 years since before tribal memory. The Abenaki are part of a larger group of indigenous people who call themselves Wabanaki or people of the dawn and form one of many communities connected by a common language family. Here at the Portsmouth Public Library, we're committed to acknowledging and honoring the human history tied to this land. So this land acknowledgement is now read at the beginning of most library programs and you can find it on our website as well. We are indebted to tonight's presenters for the language used in our land acknowledgement, as well as their help in planning this ongoing series. We'd also like to acknowledge something else tonight, which is that there is another event being held at the same time as ours on Zoom, Indigenous People of the Piscataqua Watershed, which is hosted by Dover 400 in celebration of Dover's 400th anniversary and the Dover Public Library. We are really thrilled that there's so much interest in our local indigenous history, and we're happy to announce that both programs will be recorded so you don't have to miss a thing. Um, so that's also to say that this event is currently being recorded and it will be available in the next week or two on the library's YouTube page and on the homepage of our website, should you wish to revisit it. Looking forward on Thursday, February 15th, we'll host our next Indigenous Stories event, which is titled Decolonial Organizing and Collaboration in New Hampshire, the case of INHCC. Members of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, including Dr. Svetlana Peshkova of UNH, will discuss how Indigenous and non-Indigenous community members work together toward creating a decolonial narrative of the history past and present and imagining future for our local diverse communities. They will describe an equitable community building that recognizes contributions of indigenous peoples as important and foundational threads of the social fabric <clears throat> in this state and other parts of this country and continent and elsewhere in the world. They share their experiences in the hope that local communities can replicate these efforts. So we hope that you can join us for the next in our indigenous stories series and I will share a registration link in the chat. If you have questions about this or any other library services or upcoming programs, feel free to ask at the end. And I wanna say that we love hearing from you about what you'd like to see at the library or for this series in particular. So at the end of the event, I'm going to share, excuse me, an online event feedback form. If you fill it out, you'll not only help the library, you'll also be entered to win a library book bag, although you do have to be local to win. Just a reminder um, to keep your audio and video off. And if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat and we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. I will deliver questions to our presenters. So feel free to write them at any time in the chat. There will be some time at the end. Um, I wanna thank Strawberry Bank, the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective and the Kawasuk Band of the Penacook Abenaki people for their work in making this series happen. And I am so pleased to welcome back Ann Dennison and Dr. Alexander Martin tonight for their presentation on the Strawberry Bank exhibit, People of the Dawnland. So welcome, Alex and Ann. Thank, Thank you. you, Laura. Yeah. So I'm just going to begin with a quick overview of some of the topics that we'll cover tonight. Um, some of you might have seen Anne and me present before, and so there might be some information in this presentation that is familiar to you, um, but we've tried to incorporate some some fresh threads as well. So we're gonna begin with a basic introduction. Um, I mean, we could write a whole book about this, but a basic introduction to who the Abenaki, the people of the Donland are. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of living history museums and their impact on indigenous people in the United States. And then talk a little specifically about Strawberry Bank Museum, where Anne and I both work. And then the main body of the presentation will be Anne and, and my discussion of the development of our People of the Dawnland exhibit at the museum and how the threads of all those other um, topics we'll cover affect uh, the, the exhibit that you um, might experience in person or virtually these days. Oh, thank you, Alex, for getting us going. We're going to start with um, 
an impossible task, which is introducing you to 12,000 years of Abenaki history. But the Abenaki and Wabanaki people, and the, those two words actually mean the same thing. They mean people of the Dawnland, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, an ancient and continuing 12,000 or 12,000 plus year presence here in the Northeast. Um, Abenaki territory includes, in, in, why I use this map is to show you the full expanse. So New Hampshire, where we are, of course, most of us, not all, actually, maybe not all of us. Those of us who are giving the program are here in New Hampshire. Um, Vermont, Northern Massachusetts, Maine, Southeastern Quebec, and the Canadian Maritime Provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Um, the Abenaki referred to themselves as the, uh, or this homeland um, as in Dakana, and it, it means our home or our homeland, and refer to themselves as the Alnoba, which means the, the people or the actually human beings, almost every indigenous group, the, the um, tribes, the names they have for themselves mean the, the people, you know, that's who we are. Um, so the Abenaki, Wabanaki, it means people of the east, um, the place where the sun rises with the dawn each morning, Hence, the, it's come to be translated as the people of the Dawnland, because as you can see and reminding, looking at the map, we're all up here on the Northeast coast. Um, the Wabanaki tribes include the Western Abenaki, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples. And um, as Laura mentioned earlier, the Abenaki are part of the larger Algonquian culture group, which spreads west past the Great Lakes, past where the Anishinaabe people are, and as far south along the Atlantic coast um, as North Carolina, which was the homeland of the Pamlico and Tuscarora peoples before Europeans arrived. Um, some of you may know that Tuscarora actually wound up being part of the Six Nations, part of the Iroquois Confederacy as time went by. All right, I think we're moving move to the next slide. And actually, just a reminder too, if you have any you know, questions or comments, please put them in the chat um, and we'll, we'll try to you know, field some of them at the end. So the traditional life ways um, of the Abenaki people, we, we know about this through archeological evidence, through tribal oral traditions and written records. Um, the Abenaki people have supported themselves here in the Northeast for thousands of years by living closely to the land and the land provided everything that was necessary, all the raw materials necessary to sustain life. So materials for housing, fuel, food, clothing, transportation. By transportation, I'm, I'm referring mostly to dugout canoes and birch bark canoes uh, because the rivers and the ocean were the highways. Um, the Abenaki maintained diplomatic relations and trade relationships with neighboring tribes. For some reason, people tend to think that um, the tribal groups are insular and they were not, are not still. Um, there were regular gatherings and still are of larger groups of Abenaki peoples and this provided opportunities for trade and social interactions, seasonal celebrations and chances for young people to meet, you know, maybe potential marriage partners. Then through the centuries, Abenaki culture has of course gradually changed over time maintaining traditional values, but also adapting to, you know, ever advancing life ways and technological developments. You know, I, I go into schools a lot, you know, to uh, do storytelling and talk about Abenaki history. And, and I swear the younger kids are amazed that I, you know, use email <laughs> and, and get up in the morning and have a cup of tea and see what's been happening on Facebook or what have you. But, you know, the Abenaki are contemporary people today. Um, the, on the right, we're showing a panel as one of the panels that's in the exhibit at Strawberry Bank. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more later. All right, moving on. So when we're talking about the story of the Abenaki people um, in the museum, we're basically talking in three categories, the, the ancient um, history, you know, that the, we're talking 12,000 plus years back to the ice age of Abenaki presence here in the Northeast. Um, it, it is a rich and complex history, but we also need to talk about what happened when colonists came from England and France. And then we also talk about the Abenaki people today. So early European contact here in Indakana, here in our land, um, I think it can't be overstated that of all the indigenous peoples in the Americas, the Wabanaki peoples had the very first contact with the Europeans. 
So we are talking 500 or in the case of Life Erickson the Vikings, you know, a thousand years ago contact. Um, so the, we have, there are actually two digs that have been done up in, I want to say Newfoundland, but maybe one of them was in Labrador. You could weigh in on that, Alex, if you are familiar with it, um, that confirmed the Viking presence, but it's also in the Norse sagas, um, the oral tradition of the Norse people about um, the, the Vikings coming. Then later, the Basque fishermen, sometime before the 1500s, we think, maybe as early as the 1400s, were fishing in George's Banks, waters were cod, um, right off the main coast, the Nova Scotia coast there, um, in the 1500s, 14 into the 1500s. Verrazano uh, sailed for France in 1524 and completely, you know, mapped the coast. Of course, it's a very rough map compared to what we have nowadays, but he, the logs talk about encounters with the indigenous people. Um, John Smith, uh, the such an ego on this man, <laughs> not only sailed up the coast from Virginia and, and as far as um, uh, Nova Scotia, but and had interactions with the indigenous people, but decided to claim the islands off the Maine and um, you know, Kittery and Portsmouth and Rye, uh, which are known today as the Isles of Shoals, named them for himself, the Smith Isles, as though they didn't already have a name. Um, both the French and English fishermen and traders, ongoing contacts with the Wabanaki peoples all throughout the 1600s. Um, Quebec colony established up in New France in 1608. Plymouth colony in 1620. So New France and New England are established. Rye and Portsmouth and Dover, uh, 1623 with Mason's Grant, which became later New Hampshire. Boston, which became Massachusetts Bay Colony is established in 1630 which some of our, our cousins to the south of us and Montreal colony in 1642. So there is extensive early contact before we ever, you notice the end of that list was when we finally got to Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Um, so between 1620 and 1675, the first uh, 50 years of uh, English uh, in, you know, colonization there was initial 50 years of uh, a negotiated peace um, through the efforts of Massasoit in Massachusetts and Passaconaway in New Hampshire, who was a, had diplomatic relations with Mass uh, Massasoit. Um, there was, a, a, um, I don't know how to say it because it's not like it was all peace, love and joy, but there was a, a lack of overt warfare because um, there had been so many, especially in Massachusetts, so many deaths from European diseases that meant the numbers of the Wampanoag people have been reduced and Massasoit was looking for allies in the English colonists. So the, it, it gets very complex and I can't possibly go into all that right now. But from 1675, at the end of that 50 year period of time up to after the American Revolution, uh, there was one war after another after another, which some of them were wars between the colonists and the indigenous people. Some of them were wars between the English in New England and the French and New France and their allied people or just indigenous people being caught in the middle um, and trying to defend themselves, their families and their land. So again, it's complex. We can't go into it all, but come into the museum sometime when we're open. I'll be happy to chat with you. Yeah, now we can move along. So the, the third panel um, the, on one of the walls in the uh, in the museum, in our exhibit, it, it just says, we're still here, so modern life. Um, if, after the American Revolution and in the period up to 1830, um, there was still a fairly large, I think, presence of indigenous people uh, here in New Hampshire and, and all throughout Massachusetts and up into the Northeast. But um, it was very inconvenient for the new American democracy who had more and more people, uh, not only they're having new generations being born, I know, so sons of sons of sons who needed land, but more people coming over from Europe. Um, so the white European population needed more land. So in 1830, the Indian Removal Act was passed, which uh, permitted the United States government to move all indigenous peoples and west of the Mississippi River. This 
story, you know, where I think the one we hear the most is of the, the five tribes, the five civilized tribes down south, the Cherokee people and the Trail of Tears. But this law actually affected all indigenous people east of the Mississippi, including the Wabanaki peoples. And so the climate of welcome or any hope of establishing uh, good relations between the, the Wabanaki peoples and um, the American peoples, uh, I'll say now, because we've, we've come into being American instead of European colonists by this time, um, it, that was pretty much removed. So it became a time when, when uh, the Abenaki mm, had to be very, very careful. So some withdrew up north, some went up to Canada and came back, some had intermarried and kind of blended in and assimilated. Um, between the 1870s and the 1920s though, we have signs of that, of resilience in the Abenaki population. There is an ongoing presence of Abenaki artisans who were selling their handcrafted goods. They might have, many of them might have lived in, um, were living in Maine and up in Quebec, but would travel as large family groups and camp outside these huge white hotels that started popping up all over the Northeast after the Civil War. And so there, there was a lot of interaction at that point. Um, between the 1920s and the 1970s, Abenaki continued to share parts of their cultural identity with their children, but to protect themselves and stay under the radar by assimilating. And this whole phenomenon is called hiding in plain sight. So um, there are many, many people who, in the Northeast here who know, you know, who live in uh, dense indigenous populated areas. And then there are others, especially in New Hampshire uh, and probably in Vermont and I think Massachusetts who uh, it was not as evident who's indigenous, who is not because of intermarriage with both uh, white and then black Americans. Um, so this hiding in plain sight became a protective thing. If one could blend in by dressing like, speaking like, looking like, living the way the general population was living, uh, and the less they said to their children that, about their indigenous heritage that might get related in school, um, it, it became a time when people were really trying to protect themselves. Um, children were being taken away and placed in foster homes or being sent to indigenous schools to be assimilated. Again, it's a very complex story. Um, in the 1970s, the American Indian movement um, began, and, and this is the beginning, you know, this is my lifetime, I'm a teenager at that point, um, of a pan-Indian awareness, sort of a connectedness um, between indigenous groups between tribal groups across the whole nation um, started to, to happen and with it um, activists. And so by 1978, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed because of the work that was being done. Um, and the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed. So there was more protection for children to not be taken away from their families and, and put into these big institutions where they were assimilated. Um, and acculturated by force. Um, also, it now became legal for people to practice their own religion without fear of reprisals. Um, by 1980, the Maine Indian Lands Claims Settlement was passed, and this um, didn't return land to the Penobscot or Passamaquoddy people, but there was what was a, in 1980 a fairly substantial um, amount of money given in reparation. And so some of the, they were actually able, as I understand it, to buy land inland in Maine uh, to try to increase the tribal territory. In 1990, again, really important legislation, the American, uh, Native American Grace and Repatriation Act was passed and the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was created. And I, I know that Alex is gonna talk more about what we call NAGPRA, the Native American Grace and Repatriation Act as we go along and how that has impacted uh, museum institutions. All righty. On we go. Still part of the, uh, <laughs> if we hear me saying that, it's because Alex is running the slides. So I'm saying moving on here already is the next one. It's, it's uh, the best signal we've been able to come up with. 
um, 1990s to the present, there's been a proliferation of Abenaki scholarship and cultural events and fresh perspectives on the history of the Wapanaki peoples and a renewal of Abenaki cultural education through powwows and schools and workshops. Um, it's become uh, a time when the, the Abenaki people have, Wapanaki peoples don't have to fear quite as much um, as earlier on. And so it's safer to, to come out. And also there have been more opportunities um, specifically since World War II. I look to the GI Bill after World War II as a changing time because there's so many indigenous people who served in the military and took advantage of the opportunity after the war for education and wanted that education for their children. So there's a, a turning point. Uh, here in New Hampshire, it wasn't though until 2011 um, that New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs was established by New Hampshire law. And this group is an advocacy group. I'm actually looking for my little notes here and seeing if I can find a good definition. And it's failing me. Well, at any rate, um, in, the, in the chat notes we have, uh, we're putting some contact information and there's a URL so you can check out the website for the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. Um, there's a growing interest in and support of Abenaki and Wabanaki rec reconciliation initiatives, uh, land acknowledgements such as the one we heard at the beginning of this program, uh, museum exhibits, new ways of uh, interpreting in museums. Maybe there have been existing museum exhibits, but they're changing also. And the creation um, of college Native American and Indigenous Studies programs, such as the brand new University of New Hampshire. Um, NAS minor. Um, it's just about a year, I think, in existence now. Uh, the Western Abenaki language, which has been on the brink of extinction. There is a very active Abenaki language revival education program going on for the Western Abenaki language, but also I know up, um, with the Nicmec peoples, the, uh, the Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot, I'm assuming the Maliseet peoples as well. Um, I'm, I'm involved with the one with the Western Abenaki, which is Southern Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont is pretty much in, up into Quebec. It's what we think of as the Western Abenaki peoples. Then the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, which we have shortened to INHCC, was created in 2016. And this is a group of both non-Abenaki allies working in partnership with New Hampshire Abenaki elders. And this has been a very important initiative because there is a, 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 a really entrenched perception that there are no indigenous people in New Hampshire anymore. And um, so this group has really been using a multi-track approach to help the New Hampshire Abenaki community become more visible to the general public once again. So the INHCC creates initiatives that educate the public about New Hampshire history, Abenaki history rather, culture, ongoing concerns about racism, as well as that fallacy that there are no Indians in New Hampshire anymore. Um, issues, things like working on um, seeing if we can see the backs of uh, mascots that use Native American imagery in, in uh, less than positive ways. Um, thinking about uh, using tribal designations or imagery for uh, you know, school teens, all sorts of things. So we need to, we're, we're addressing all kinds of issues like that. And one of the things that I think that came, either came out of INHCC or it just worked beautifully with it because there are faculty members in the collaborative collective who are also of course on the faculty at UNH, but they, they, they worked hard to, uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, Alex, to negotiate, I guess, um, to have this year's UNH Sador series um, being hosted and it's on the indigenous uh, focus, a series of, it was going to be, I think, a weekend seminar or, or, or conference and because of COVID has become a series of webinars all focusing on New Hampshire indigenous issues and larger issues. There's a connection with this program um, working with scientists and in, in learning about how indigenous knowledge can help inform science. And there's a, I understand a, 
a program that's connecting what's going on here in New Hampshire and our, our coastline here up in, to, to Massachusetts to Maine, and then also what's happening in the Arctic with a group of scientists there. So it's an interesting collaboration that's drawing on the cultural knowledge of the Abenaki people, um, thus also, I think, providing evidence that there are still Abenaki people in New Hampshire uh, with, with knowledge to offer. Um, and that program is working with the INHCC and New Hampshire Abenaki elders. All right, next one. Okay, so we'll shift gears uh, just a little bit and talk about living history museums. So I love one of the benefits of getting to do these Zoom lectures is to have a virtual audience of people from a much wider region than the immediate Portsmouth area. So some of you may have never visited Strawberry Bank before, if that's the case, or if you haven't been since fourth grade, like many New Hampshireites. Um, Strawberry Bank is a living history museum that covers about 10 acres in downtown Portsmouth. We own just over 40 buildings, many of which are open to the public during, you know, non normal non-COVID times um, with a combination of exhibit houses, furnished houses, interpreting history from the late 1600s through the 1950s, um, and then demonstrations on site. We have a, com a combined staff of costumed role players who are interpreting real people who lived at various periods throughout the museum's history, as well as uniformed interpreters who live in 2020 or 2021 and can speak to you um, with you know, some more context. Um, we also have a variety of historic gardens um, based on archaeological evidence and documentary evidence. Um, so it's an exciting place to visit, I think. It's come a long way since its founding in 1958 and um, its rescue really by a group of historic preservationists who prevented the um, demolition of these historic houses during urban renewal. Um, so I hope that you're able to visit us there when we are open in normal times. But Strawberry Bank is part of a long history of living history museums in the United States. A basic definition for living history museums are museums that recreate a historic setting and time period in order to interpret the past through experiential visits. So these differ from other museums um, that, you know, have collections just in display cases and really try to transport you to a moment in time by providing um, the furnishings and the sounds and the people of a period of the past. Stormy Bank is a little different in that we interpret periods throughout time. Um, many living history museums pick a single year in time and commit to it like at uh, Plymouth Patuxet in Plymouth, New Hampshire, it's always 1627. Um, so these museums like this as a, a alternative to collections-based, you know, origins and cabinet of curiosity style museums. Um, living history museums have their origins in 19th century world's fairs, where people would bring together various exhibits to demonstrate the architectural styles and the cultures and folk cultures of different places around the world. So a couple wealthy industrialists in the early 20th century said, hey, this is a great idea. We can do this year round. We can build it. They will come. Um, so among the first living history museums in the country, we have Greenfield Village founded by Henry Ford in Michigan in 1929. And that's the photo you can see in the top right. And then one of the most well-known, of course, Colonial Williamsburg founded in 1936 by John D. Rockefeller. Um, and living history interpreters, role players representing those first person um, versions of stories were first introduced at Pioneer Village in Salem, Massachusetts in 1930. So the museum world developed quite a bit, of course, from the early 20th century through the mid 20th century. 
and really professionalized, like mark markedly, notably around 1970, which is the year that the Association for Living History Farm and Agricultural Museums was established, which um, began to set some ethical standards um, and practices for the whole field. So from the 1970s through the 1990s, we entered this new era for living history museums that introduced more academically trained historians and more diverse scholars that were seeking to interpret more difficult histories. Um, one perfect example of that is introducing the history of enslaved Africans and slave auctions at Colonial Williamsburg, which is a whole other presentation, um, as well as introducing um, first person Native American or tribal representative role players. Um, these photos are both from Colonial Williamsburg. Also in 1990, as Anne mentioned before, came the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So this went hand in hand with the professionalization and the introduction of more diverse voices into the museum field. As people began to um, enter the museum field and realize that hundreds of thousands of indigenous human skeletal remains and the associated funerary objects, aka artifacts in archaeological terms, um, were being stored in boxes in federal and state institutions. Um, they realized that, and in addition to many decades of Native Americans, um, petitioning to change this. Um, so NAGPRA caused a moment in time for museums and federal agencies, uh, universities as well, to inventory those human remains that they had in storage and then offer to return them to federally recognized tribes for repatriation and in most cases reburial. Um, and another part of NAGPRA that's really important is in any future excavations, um, or really in the repatriation pro uh, process as well, it had a requirement to consult with Indigenous people, which seemed like a novel idea um, in 1990. But in my mind, since 1990, over the past 30 years, it's really encouraged a new generation of anthropologists and museum professionals who are willing not only to consult as mandated by federal law, but to really converse and collaborate with indigenous um, colleagues. So I have an example that is, um, I think will hit close to home for us here in New Hampshire and here in 2021 to illustrate why NAGPRA um, and why the legacy of living history museums was so damaging. Um, and this little guy in the right hand corner here is named Minnick Wallace. He was one of six Inuit people who were brought to Manhattan from Greenland um, to be studied at the Mer American Museum of Natural History. So this was still a time where it was um, part of the collections philosophy of museums to bring living people to museums to study and um, to put their culture on display. When Minnick was seven, his father died of tuberculosis and the museum staged a fake funeral and then put his father's skeletal remains on exhibit in the museum. And Minnick didn't find out about that until he was a little older and heard um, like through the grapevine from his classmates that those were his father's remains. Um, and he petitioned until he died to have those remains repatriated so he could rebury them and was unsuccessful in doing so. Um, and the reason I say it might hit close to home for us is because Minnick ultimately moved to New Hampshire and worked at a lumber camp here. And then in 1918 died during the Spanish influenza pandemic and he's buried here in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. So there's stories like this all over the country. You might have also heard of Ishii, a Yahi man out in California who was brought to a museum and studied by Alfred Krober, a famous anthropologist. Um, his brain was kept in storage until um, just the early 2000s. Um, he was finally repatriated. 
So uh, we could find stories all over the country, but um, I think it's an important example, important to recognize a person's name and realize why um, some indigenous people might have had um, a, a difficult or complicated relationship with museums, especially living history museums. So along with um, the, the changes in the field since the 1970s and since 1990, we've entered an era in the 2000s where um, the language of decolonization and land acknowledgements is now common, more commonplace. Um, so I have here a page from um, the American Alliance of Museums 2019 Trends Watch which um, included an article about the work of decolonization, of reversing the harmful effects of colonialism and of colonization on the way that we teach and talk about history. Um, and then a couple examples of kind of local land acknowledgements. So this one in Maine is at the Abbey Museum up in Bar Harbor. And this one on the glass is at the Courier Museum right here in New Hampshire. And this one also is based on language developed by um, the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective in consultation with the Native American or the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. So we also wanted to mention some other museums that have inspired us, um, uh, Anne and me, as museum professionals, some of which are specifically focused on Native culture and other museums that have featured exhibits. Um, so some of those museums include Mount Kearsarge, also here in New Hampshire, the Abbey Museum, the Courier Museum, which had an exhibit featuring Abenaki culture and history, the Tomaquag Museum down in Rhode Island, run by the Narragansett tribe. The Musée de Odenac, the first um, indigenous museum up in Canada. And then some recent exhibits right here in the Seacoast region at the um, Old Berwick Historical Society and another one holding up the sky at the Maine Historical Society. So moving on to talk about our People of the Dawnland exhibit. Um, this is the Jones House Discovery Center front room before we created People of the Dawnland. Um, the Jones House is one of the museum houses that is not a furnished exhibit, but it's an exhibit house. And this one in particular is one um, that offers some hands-on interactive programming and activities for families. And so it used to be kind of a um, shopping then and now um, around the neighborhood space for the children. And don't worry, all these food items have not gone away. They've just moved. Um, but I mention it, um, I, I mention it here because before Jones House was the Discovery Center, it was actually the building that housed the archaeology department at Strawberry Bank. So as the current archaeologist at Strawberry Bank, I've inherited a collection um, and continue to dig up stuff and add to that collection um, of over a million artifacts that have been excavated on the museum grounds since 1967. And so for many years, the Jones House was a space where visitors could come and see um, lab work in progress and also an archeological exhibit. And the focus of our archeological exhibits and collection at Strawberry Bank is of course mostly historical, mostly artifacts that were produced by and used by the Euro-American um, inhabitants of the neighborhood. In our collection of over a million artifacts and like 1500 boxes, this slide represents almost all of the indigenous made artifacts um, that we have. I, I just wanna point out here that just because something is made by a Euro-American um, or made by, by an English person in England, doesn't prohibit it from having also been used or traded by native people. Um, but here we have items that we know were made by um, Abenaki people dating all the way back to 12,000 years ago. Um, this is a chert blade tool that was used um, by some of the earliest inhabitants of the Piscataqua region. Um, and then some smaller projectile points, and then a series of earthenware um, ceramic pot sherds, pieces of cooking pots that were introduced um, in the 
archaeological period of history that we refer to as the woodland period when native people started becoming um, or started growing food and um, cooking over fires in these clay pots. So because of the way Strawberry Bank is designed, these artifacts didn't fit into any furnished houses. Um, so there wasn't a great space for us to be able to talk about the native history that is physically represented by these artifacts and also is part of the oral histories and documented history of the area. But then we, we shifted gears. We did. Um, I was contacted in um, the, the early winter of 2017 by the education director at Strawberry Bank and asked if I would be interested in doing a storytelling performance for the summer camp uh, kids. And I think it was the following July or August. And Becky was way ahead of, on, on the ball there, way ahead of the game. And um, yeah, I was happily, happy to do that. I've been telling stories, uh, indigenous, you know, Abenaki traditional stories for a long time. Um, but part of that conversation, that gave me an opportunity to, um, to see if there was a door that could be opened. I, I actually uh, grew up, went through junior high school and high school uh, in Portsmouth and was aware of Strawberry Bank during my whole growing up time. And my training uh, as an adult went into uh, history, early American history and also storytelling, it's not a degree in that, but also um, I, I was a classroom teacher for about 20 years. And all during that time, I kept thinking, someday I'm going to approach Strawberry Bank and see if they would be interested in uh, developing some kind of Abenaki interpretation program. And so that phone call with Becky turned out to be the, the door opening. I asked if the Strawberry Bank had ever considered that. Um, even though it wasn't part of the historic house program, there is multiple physical and also written evidence of the Abenaki presence in Portsmouth in the great in the Seacoast region and specifically Portsmouth. And there was, there was a tremendous interest. Um, they just, there had never been somebody um, knocking on the door asking them um, if, if there was one. And so we arranged a meeting and actually that's when I met Alex. So in the winter of February of 2017, and so we started talking about the feasibility, how this could work, especially because it was already February and the museum is gonna be opening at the end of April for that season. Um, and so out of that meeting, and we, we kicked around an awful lot of ideas, um, I, I was asked if I knew how to make baskets, if I would be willing to be in the um, cotton tenant house north where the basket makers uh, had a demonstration area sharing the building with weavers. And I said, well, I don't make, um, I don't make ash splint baskets, but I do make birch bark baskets and twined uh, coiled uh, corn husk baskets. Would that work? And they said, sure. So I wound up spending the summer of 2017 in the, the back room a couple of days a week. And I think what was the old kitchen area, I'm not sure in, in that building having conversations with visitors as they came through. Um, and there was a lot of interest. I guess there were quite a few comments written in the guest book or what have you over at the visitor center during that summer. And um, so the next summer I wound up in, what is the thing with me and kitchens, I guess. I just realized the, the slide on the left is the summer I was in Cotton Tenant House North. And then the next summer, the slide on the right, I was in the kitchen at Jones House. And it was actually a larger, um, better lit space, which was lovely as far as I was concerned. And we had many people coming through, we actually had some elbow room in there to stop and had some amazing conversations. And so interest was evident. And I was also astonished how many people were identifying themselves to me as, as people who live here in the Northeast and have indigenous heritage. It was really quite touching. Um, so that summer, both of those summers, we, I was just sort of an ancillary program. The first summer with the basket weavers, basket makers and the, um, you know, cloth weavers. The next summer on my own in the back room of the, what is one of the education buildings, Jones. Um, and then, um, 
then we rolled so us there two summers and then we actually would go on to the next slide um, got to a place where we were evaluating in 2019 what had been how you know the success of the previous two years and the interest uh, which actually exceeded my wildest expectations, um, you know, on the part of the, the visitors and people who came through and comments were made. And so we started talking about, well, what if, you know, what if, what if we could expand this? And um, this slide just, it kind of represents um, how we transferred that, that room that Alex showed you that had been one of the archaeological rooms. And then later, I think it was like a kitchen and uh, like gift shoppy kind of room that was being interpreted in the front of Jones. And this uh, slide indicate, shows you how we started to transform that. But I kind of want to save that story for as we're moving on a little bit in the presentation. This is just to introduce the idea to you. So as we get into, I'm not sure where to start here, Alex. Uh, Maybe you want to jump in and tell us with me. Sure. So. Yeah, I think that Ann and I put this slide uh, kind of first in talking about the development of the exhibit for the same reason that we began with it in our presentation this evening. Um, Ann and I and pretty much the whole education department went over and sat in this room in Jones house and looked around and said, okay, if we're going to put an exhibit in here, what do we want to include? What do we want to convey? Um, and so we took this wall that has two windows in the middle and said this would be a perfect way to represent these three really important themes of introducing who are the Abenaki people. We want to include that long-term history in New Hampshire. Um, we want to address the difficulties and the resilience of the colonial period and we really want to emphasize that Abenaki people are still here. Um, so this is kind of where we began talking about the exhibit. To add to that, it yeah. was for me. It was really uh, a fascinating process because Alex and I were working in consultation um, with one another, with the staff people, and also with some Abenaki elders um, to try to bring together issues that we thought would uh, not only be of interest but were really important. If we can, if we only have a small space in a short amount of time to share information about the Abenaki people, if we want this space to be able to speak about the Abenaki people, even when there's no one there specifically designated to be interpreter, you know, how can we tell this story? Because I, I was in the museum, you know, I think two days a week the first year, maybe the second year also, and, and then in 2019, I think it was three or four days um, a week, but that still left a lot of time when the exhibit needed to speak for itself. And so I was really excited about this, this part of the exhibit where we not only talked in the, in the left hand about the ancient history and the traditions, uh, the traditional ways of living, but at the middle uh, panel, we got to talk about a very important treaty that was signed, important because we have the document. Not so much that it was any more successful than any other treaty that was signed between the um, Wabanaki peoples and the English, um, not for the, in, you know, indigenous people, and it was quite successful for the Europeans, um, but because the documentation exists. In this page, there were, uh, you can see in the center there with the handwriting are the written signatures of delegates that were representing quite a few different uh, Wabanaki tribal groups from uh, throughout Maine and New Hampshire and up actually, I think, into the Canadian Maritime Provinces. I'm pretty sure we have at least one or two there who are um, neither Mi'kmaq or Maliseet. And then the bottom part of that panel is talking about that period that I mentioned earlier with photographs of the indigenous craftspeople uh, I, that were I, actually, I think these are from up around um, North Conway area. There was one family that came back year after year after year. They would spend the winter up at Odenac um, in Quebec uh, making baskets and the children going to school and what have you, and then come spend all summer uh, camped out near some of these big hotels. And so these are the image, some images, uh, you can see them close up of, of one of the families um, and, you know, showing their, their basketry. And actually that's a, a historic landmark location um, up in North Conway nowadays. There's 
the camp existed for a long time. Now there's a green marker, but at least the story is still told. And then the third panel, the we're still here, which actually blows people away. <laughs> they come through. I'm continually, when I'm in there, um, struck by how many people think there absolutely are no indigenous people in New Hampshire anymore. I think of all um, of the New England states, um, it, it's, this is the one that we are, are the most invisible uh, from what I have, you know, from my own personal experience and from talking to other people. But we have a statistic up, uh, on the top of this panel that uh, from the 2010 census that 7,000 people identified themselves uh, in that year as uh, e either, well, they couldn't designate by tribe, but we know that's probably five or 6,000 people were Abenaki. There could be a thousand or two. There were other tribes that moved in. You know, we are a mobile society nowadays. People move. And so, you know, there's, it's a representative sample, but we're expecting that that number is going to increase. I, in the, to, I'll be amazed if in the 2020 census, that number hasn't gone up because I went and looked back at the census for the last 30, 40 years. And every year there's been an increase, which is for two reasons. One is natural increase. In other words, the Abenaki people are not being killed off, hauled away, put in institutions anymore, and children are surviving. Um, you know, it's both of those things. And then there's the, this other one, that people are willing to identify themselves. There were decades, there was a century when, you know, it was not safe to identify publicly. Um, if, you know, as, as being indigenous in New Hampshire, if it could be avoided, which led to that whole myth about there are no indigenous people here anymore. So seeing it on the census helps to counteract that. And then also on that panel, we put uh, artwork by a couple of contemporary uh, indigenous New Hampshire artists um, to show that hat on the left is showing a very modern take on ash flint basketry and, and um, how that can be used in new ways. And the, the hats on the right, obviously the ball caps, but they have traditional uh, Abenaki beadwork on them. Um, so I, I really enjoy these three, this triptych of, of panels because it gives a, an opportunity to talk about the entire spectrum of Abenaki history. And people come in and they have either no information about it at all, or they maybe know one or two little things about you know, Abenaki history. Uh, by the way, I say Abenaki because that's how you say it in American English, but in uh, the Abenaki language or in French, it's Abenaki. So if, if you are uh, an informed person who's wondering why I, I'm using Abenaki, it's because I was, that's what I was raised with. Um, they're both proper, it depends on what language you're speaking or what you know you're speaking languages. Okay, I'm thinking we're ready to maybe move on to the next slide. Yeah, I might flip through the next slides um, relatively quickly so we can get to like what happened in 2020. Yeah. Um, but I do just wanna show people some of the stuff that, that they would see at the exhibit in person, um, some information about the three sisters gro um, and growing corn, beans and squash. Um, some more information and examples of traditional Abenaki arts being done by um, current modern artists, including Anne. Yeah. Um, we have Willow Green, uh, Liz Green, Charles Bois, Rhonda Bissau, and Denise Puglio all contributed uh, images of their art to that panel. Um, we also have uh, over here, a lending library, because we recognized uh, that some of our staff and many of our visitors might want to learn more. Um, so we envisioned this. There's some like kids books on the lower shelves so people could sit down and actually take a break from um, their museum fatigue and read a book um, and also arranged it so that our colleagues at the museum could check out some of these more reference books. And then just like um, in the panel that Anne was just mentioning, the different artists who contributed their artwork, we continued that idea of consultation and collaboration to work with other people in our area um, to provide some resources. So this fur panel here that uses indigenous words uh, for different local animals, we borrowed from the Old Borough Historical Society and these uh, touchable basket panels we borrowed from Denise Puglio, um, Sagamo Squaw of the Pentecote Band of 
um, Abenaki Indians. Um, and then we found a space for those archaeological artifacts, which made me very happy. And Anne says that people stop and, and read about the... They do. They stop <laughs> and read the fine print and are fascinated. And the interesting thing that I mentioned to them is there's never, that we haven't, there's not been a reason to do a specific dig looking for indigenous artifacts. They're just there. <laughs> you know, they're, they're throughout the entire area. You can't have 12,000 years of continuing presence without there being artifacts. And there have been many archaeological digs throughout New Hampshire um, of a much larger scope. These were lucky finds. And, yeah. you know, yeah. it's really kind of cool. Um, and then just another exhibit case that showing some local materials and some other um, objects and replica items. Um, but we can touch on that a little more, but I do want to be able to talk about 2020. What a year, right? Um, so we were only open from July to October this year instead of our normal season of May to October um, for outdoor only tours. And we were only able to operate at about 25% of our normal visitor capacity. So we added a bunch of virtual programming, of course, um, a virtual archeological field school, virtual summer camps run by our education department and virtual lectures for our members, including a lecture by Anne and me during November, which is Native American Heritage Month. And so I just wanna point out some of the ways that introducing this exhibit into a part of our museum's fabric has influenced um, what it occurs to us to do in our virtual programming. So for example, um, our director of education, Becky, who I think is here in the audience, um, led a team effort to put together a virtual tour of the museum using an app called Time Looper, which I'm sure um, you'll be able to access very soon. And it includes a land acknowledgement right in the introduction, um, as well as a video tour featuring Anne of the People of the Dawnland exhibit. Never your best look when a video is frozen, right? <laughs> no. um, and I'll, I'll let you talk about these other opportunities, Anne. Uh, the ones on the left are um, when, when I'm in the museum, uh, usually I'm, in, I'm demonstrating an Abenaki craft. Um, that that uh, collar, the yoke collar that I was working on there pretty much off and on through the entire summer of 2019, um, I, I interspersed with other projects, um, but I finished it that summer, which was kind of fun. It's just using traditional Abenaki beadwork, but then I also demonstrate how to make corn husk dolls and how to make birch bark containers and all sorts of other things. And it enables me to be there in low key and being able to have conversations with people as they come through all day long. Um, the images over on the right were a way to take that experience of interacting with visitors and again, put it online. Um, this is me uh, with the, doing a Zoom uh, visit with summer camp this summer, uh, talking about the Abenaki people and then leading the, the uh, kids to making uh, with artificial wampum, um, purple and white, um, it beads, how to make different, you know, do bead work to make necklaces or, or bracelets or what have you. But it got, I got to talk about what wampum is and how that was made from, uh, you know, the quahog shell and that sort of thing. So, and they had wonderful questions. They were a delight. But again, it was the, the necessity to move our program online because of COVID, the buildings couldn't be open uh, this year, the historic buildings. And then uh, again, the, the image on the left here is showing some games that we have on a counter. And actually I saw a comment from somebody in, I'm watching the notes just a little bit as they come up in the chat, talking about how, the height of these things. And everything is pretty much at waist height, except for there's one exhibit case that's down low and yes, people have to squat down to look at it. And some of the books for children on our lower level, everything else is sort of up at uh, three feet and up. This is a counter that has some whirly gigs that are made with uh, sinew and buttons from deer antler. And we, so we teach the children how to play a game with that. Also the bits of birch bark uh, are actually the little um, uh, pouches that you see there are attached by string and it's like the old ball and cup game. But that old ball and cup game 
was something that, you know, many different cultures came up with versions of, and the Abenaki had before European contact had that. And adults come through and play with those all day long. But how, again, how could we take a program that, that let us do interpretation for children and take that virtual? So the image on the right is actually, again, a still from a video we did um, every, every year in November, there's a month of programming where schools come for field trips and learn about how Thanksgivings have been celebrated throughout the years and how it became a national holiday in the United States, you know, the whole morphing of it. My piece of this has been to teach children about all of the Thanksgivings that the Abenaki people celebrate. There is not just one in November. You know, there is, uh, there are every, every day, every month is a time to be thankful for the Abenaki people, but specifically there's a, you know, and there's a, a maple sugar uh, moon festival and there's a strawberry festival, there's green corn festival, and then like there's the harvest festival, which coincides more or less with Christmas, I mean, with Thanksgiving. And then there's the greetings maker moon and that is the new year that comes in December around the solstice. And so this video allowed me to talk using my drum show the images on the turtle's back. Turtle represents the earth um, in many, actually for many tribes throughout the, our, our continent. But I, on turtle's back, there are 13 different segments that show the, the moons thoughts through the year and how with representative um, images. And so that's what I talk through on the, on the video for the children as I'm talking about the, the holidays. So that's a kind of a fun way to take our Thanksgiving program online. Uh, so it's available. So there are virtual field trips that are being done with the school students this year. Yeah. I also just wanted to mention a forthcoming exhibit at the museum whenever we're able to gather in person to again. Um, a new exhibit called Water Has a Memory will open in the Carter Collection Center. And one of the elements of this exhibit is some imagined or well, some illustrated perspectives based on historic and documentary and oral evidence um, will help us imagine what Puddle Dock used to look like and might look like in a hundred years time um, with sea level rise. So on the left, a couple photos of the Puddle Dock um, open green space as you see them today when it hasn't rained and then when it has recently rained. Um, and then an illustration on the right of what one of the earliest iterations of this tidal inlet of the Piscataqua River would have looked like, um, featuring the shell middens and um, the vegetation and the people of pre-contact New Hampshire. Um, and this again, grew out of the conversations that we had had um, developing our exhibit and then collaboration with the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective and our tribal colleagues there. And for those who have not been to the museum, just that whole grassy area on the left, that was originally the Tidal Inlet, yes? Yes, thank yeah. you, Anne. Yeah, yeah, that filled in around the yeah. turn of the century. I forgot yeah. that yeah. <laughs> key piece. So we're seeing, you know, before and then after, and we may go back to we may go back to that again. You never know. Right. Um, so we have some big plans for future growth, although I hope that you can see that we've continued to incorporate elements of um, Indigenous heritage and culture into more than just, um, you know, a kitchen and a house or um, our single exhibit in the Jones House. But some of our plans for the future include some more interactive exhibits and activities, an actual Three Sisters Garden outside, um, and we have had some conversations with local um, MCs about hosting an annual on-site powwow. So we encourage people to, of course, come visit the museum. And if you're especially interested, um, we encourage you to become a museum member to help support this mission um, and to stay tuned. You know, you'll be on our newsletter and get to hear about next steps. Yeah, I'm thinking as you were talking about it, it occurred to me to also mention one of the exhibits that we're working on is an interactive Abenaki language touchscreen uh, exhibit as well. So all kinds of really cool stuff on the horizon as we grow and develop the program once we're past COVID. Yeah. 
Um, there's a question in the chat, and um, we, in fact, knowing this is a library event, have some suggested further reading, um, including some of our favorite Abenaki authors, including, uh, including Lisa Brooks, especially her book, Our Beloved Kin, uh, the recent winner of the Bancroft Prize. She's a pretty big deal. Um, and Joseph Bruchak, who's a prolific author, um, many children's books as well that would be appropriate for kids and teens. Um, another New Hampshire author, Colin, Colin Calloway, his most recent book about um, the history of indigenous people is called The Indian World of George Washington. Um, and then our colleague at UNH, Siobhan Sr., is the editor of this beautiful volume called Dawnland Voices that features writings from Indigenous people all over the Northeast. Um, and we'll stop there, right, Anne? Yeah, Olioni, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. being with us tonight and for your interest. Thank you both, that was really fabulous. Um, I saved up some questions for the chat if you'd like to get into them. Sure. Um, I'll start with a small one. And in the slide that had a few of the baskets that you'd made, someone was curious, what would be the typical use for that? Um, I believe it was a birch bark basket with the long handle at the front. I'm trying to think. Oh, if, well, if it was conical shape. Oh, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, right. it's a dipper. Um, the birch bark containers, birch bark is incredibly waterproof. That's why it was used for canoes. Um, it's stitched, and as you can see on the basket behind, um, those, those seams had to be sealed. Um, usually it was the pitch from spruce trees that was boiled down and used as a sealant. But the, the dipper would be used for dipping water, dipping soup, dipping any liquid. Uh, and so it, it's a ladle. Uh, but that conical shape is used for other things too, like an elongated conical shape of a hole in the end is a moose collar. <laughs> you know, it, it's like a megaphone. Um, so there are all kinds of uses. Birch is what was used particularly um, for anything that was going to hold food or drink because it is naturally antimicrobial and antibacterial. And so, you know, people discovered, well, wherever indigenous peoples are, they, they live closely to the land and discover the best uses for the materials around them. Birch happens to be excellent for food and drink containers as well as for carriers, um, like backpacks for... Uh, for um, baby holding, you know, like little cradle board kind of things and also for um, big transportation canoes. Uh, so all kinds of uses there. I hope that answers the question. It's a ladle. I think it does, thank you. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions about the Abenaki in general. Um, one person asked if you could explain a little bit the difference between the Abenaki and the Penacook. Are they two different tribes? Are they interrelated? What is the relationship between those two different names? When you get um, a name like um, Penacook or Sakoki or Kawasuk, um, it, it's usually identifying with the K, um, identifies the end of a, a, a location. So it's like saying, I'm, I'm from New Hampshire, I'm an American who lives in New Hampshire, but I happen to live in Lee or Dover, or, you know, I'm a are you a Portsmouthian? Are you a Portsmouthite? What's a person from, you know, I say, so it's a way of physically identifying where the village is or where the group of people are, but they are all of the Abenaki, Wabanaki peoples. Um, so all the places that I mentioned earlier on, so New Hampshire, Northern Massachusetts, Vermont, all of Maine, Southern Quebec and the Maritime provinces, all are Wabanaki peoples. Uh, and so there are other specific names and that's location. Like I understand Penobscot, uh, it comes from the word, uh, means like the rocky place, the rocky place. Um, I could be wrong there, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. But Scatiqua means the branched river. Um, if you look at a picture of the map of the Scatiqua River, you can see how it branches out once you get inland to Great Bay and all the tributaries. Um, so Piscataqua Indians are, you know, would be people who lived in this area, but they're still Abenaki. Just like, you know, I live in Lee, but I'm still New Hampshire citizen, I'm an American citizen. 
just of course said it geographically. Am I nailing it, Alex? Or yeah, you? yeah, of course. Okay. I just wanted to add on a little bit and point, well, echo your remarks from earlier that the um, ancient Abenaki people wouldn't have used those same terms. Right. Um, they would have referred to themselves as al -Nabak, and it's a very um, uh, different way uh, of right. using place names to identify people um, that's been imposed on indigenous people, not just Abenaki, you yeah. know, all Thank over. Thank you. By historians, by European by and later American authors. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's great. Thank you. Um, someone asked whether there is any Abenaki land in New Hampshire that is, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm elaborating on their question at this point. It's me asking um, that's, that's, owned by an Abenaki tribe or is deeded to Abenaki people or anything like that? No, not officially. There's no state recognized or federally recognized um, uh, Abenaki land or reserves in New Hampshire. Um, it's actually the only state, the only place in Abenaki territory where there's no official recognition of tribal groups. But there are tribal groups and individual Abenakis on land and there may be some of the couple of Abenaki uh, tribes that are in New Hampshire, although they are not federally or state recognized, they exist. Um, and that's a story in itself. It goes back to the Revolutionary War and I'm not going there tonight. It's a long <laughs> story why there are some recognized groups within you know, Abenaki territory and others are not. Um, the Abenaki are recognized in Canada, those who live in Canada, but not, you know, so there is First Nations people in Canada, but not in the United States. Thank you. That's a good summary. Um, someone also asked about um, the written language of Abenaki, and I know you ha you probably have a lot to say about that, and and about um, relearning Abenaki as well. Yeah, it's an interesting story. You know, there are there are those who believe that the the Abenaki may have even used birch bark to write on, but there's nothing you know left of that. However, it became literate really early on. Um, because of the early contact with the Europeans and the European um, uh, proclivity toward writing records, every all kinds of records. And so as early as the 1600s, Jesuits up in New France uh, were writing down uh, Abenaki words and translating them into French, but also creating dictionaries. And um, then that also was, was echoed by people like Roger Williams down in Rhode Island, you know, taking the language of the Americas, I think his little book was called. Um, there have been other efforts uh, early. So in the, in the early 1600s, maybe is the late 1500s to write down Abenaki words. And then there were Abenaki scholars that, you know, as we got into the, the 17 and 1800s, particularly the 1800s um, and the early 1900s, um, who were writing in, uh, in French and Abenaki, or English and Abenaki, or English, French and Abenaki. And so there's, there are several ex existing dictionaries, and there's a process going on right now to try to pull all that information together. So if people are interested in that, they can um, pursue it by, you can just write in a, uh, westernabenaki.com, and it will take you to a site where uh, Jesse Bruchak is putting together um, a compendium because I, a lot of these books are right there. You can download them because they're pre-copyright or have gone out of copyright. And there's also uh, a link there to the Indakana Education Center uh, in New York where Jesse lives, I believe, um, but where there are classes that are held pre-COVID you know, in person, but now there's an online school that's going pretty much every day and several nights a week. Um, and so there, there are a tremendous number of people who are through Zoom almost every night working on learning the Abenaki language, which is fascinating. Um, and the more you learn about it and learn the language, it helps to train the mind to think and to see the world the way traditional Abenaki people would see the world. The, the, every language expresses the ideals and the beliefs and the understandings of the world of that group of people. And so as we learn the language, we're learning more culturally about the understandings of, of the Abenaki people. It's really interesting stuff. Does that help? 
so completely literate by you know now and um, working on it since the 1600s. Um, just thinking about what else. So um, someone asked a question about tribal groups working for state and federal recognition. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that struggle and also the issues with, it, with um, gaining federal recognition too. Hmm. I, I can give you my take on it. I'm, I'll speak for me. I'm not presumed to speak for all Abenaki people anywhere in New Hampshire or throughout the entire territory. My take on it is that gaining state and or federal recognition can be a decades long process. Um, it is a long, complicated, expensive um, and legal, legal process. So there, there's a tremendous amount of documentation that has to be done and um, a tremendous amount of, you know, court findings and, and working with the state legislatures. And, you know, it depends on the groups. You know, most of the Abenaki people that I'm familiar with are like, you know, we're okay. We don't, we don't need the federal government or the state government to sustain us. We're educated, autonomous human beings. Um, it has been really cool to have the, uh, it's a silly term, but it's quite lovely to have the commission exist, the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs, because it's been a unifying point. Um, having the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective is, is a wonderful boom. It's, a, again, it's a way to collaborate. Um, and so people are becoming more connected with one another. And there is um, a sense of community here in New Hampshire, but there are, is no reservation area such as people understand what that means. If I could provide like a, um, a little broader context as yeah. well, um, just some like numbers for you. There are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Um, only I think 18 of which have gone through the Office of Federal Acknowledgement that's part of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and use the criteria they set out. That's how complicated it is um, that since the, the um, criteria were set in the 1970s, <laughs> only that many tribes have been able to become recognized that way. The other hundreds have been recognized through acts of Congress. Um, and the seven criteria are written from an exclusively um, you know, very bureaucratic Euro-American point of view that don't take into account um, indigenous ways of knowing or the legacy of um, acculturation and removal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, some of the criteria require things that, that the US government specifically <laughs> prevented indigenous people from doing. Um, and then, and as Anne mentioned, it's incredibly time and labor and money intensive. Um, another federally recognized tribe I work with, their petition to the OFA um, is 14 bankers boxes of paperwork and took five years of processing um, to go through the process. So it's very complicated. Thank you for, for bringing us back to that perspective. Um, Alex, because I, I think it's important to understand that um, there, are, there are reasons why the Abenaki people were not evident. And actually one of them is because they fought on the side of the English in the Revolutionary War, most of them. Uh, so, you know, the, the Wabanaki peoples along the coast, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, and the Malice, did enter into a relationship with the federal government before there was a federal government they, with the mm -hmm. colonial, you know, with the uh, Continental Congress that allowed them to, to negotiate for their own land of which they only received a small portion of which they had actually been promised, but that predated the United States. Um, since the Western Abenaki were fighting on the side of the British, that dynamic was completely different for, for the Abenaki people, basically in New Hampshire, Southern Maine, Vermont, and into Quebec a different relationship entirely. Um, so there's two different sets. So if you ask, are there re reservation lands in Wabanaki territory? Yes, but in New Hampshire, no. 
that's really helpful context. Thank you very much. Um, someone asked if, if we know how many indigenous children were sent to boarding school in this area or in New Hampshire in general? I don't. No, I hear lots of stories from people. Um, particularly hear stories in Vermont about the eugenics project in the early 1900s and um, how people went out of their way to hide their identity so that they wouldn't get caught up in that. Um, and in Maine, much study has been done about uh, children who were taken away. There's a, a, a Dawnland uh, documentary that came out, I think last year, or maybe about two, two years ago now, I'm not Recently. sure. Yeah, um, that talks about, it's, it's actually interviewing people in my age group uh, and older who were taken away from their families and sent to boarding school and, you know, completely um, treated horribly. I just, I'm not even going to go into depth here. Uh, so I'm sure that there were people from New Hampshire, but we haven't been able to connect, to have, or at least I haven't, with, to have those kinds of stories um, shared with people yet here in New Hampshire. The internet is changing that being able to connect and communicate with people. Um, that's been a kind of a flip side positive outcome of COVID with, with everybody going online, indigenous people have also, and we're meeting folks even within our own state that we've never met before. Um, maybe had conversations with or emailed with, but not actually gotten to know. And that's changing now for us too. Um, so do I know specific stories about people in New Hampshire? No. Am I sure somebody did experience that? Yeah. 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 Um, speaking of internet, someone has asked in the chat where we will be sharing all these links. Uh, so what I will do is the chat will be saved at the end of this program and I will send a copy minus some of the, you know, AV issue <laughs> sort of stuff um, with all the links in it to all the participants of this program. So you'll get all the links that we have shared that Alex shared during the presentation and, and from the library as well. Um, to answer that question. I have, I have a question for you. This is for me. Um, so one of the things that I enjoy most about your presentation is just hearing how embarking or, or setting out to create this exhibit, which is such a small part of Strawberry Bank when you look at all the many things that you do, really changed the way that you thought about so many other projects and has, has changed your mindset, um, particularly for people who are already at Strawberry Bank, right? And so it's transformational. And the word that is going to come up next month in our Indigenous Stories program, but you also mentioned it, Alex, when you were talking about other museums' work, is de decolonizing. And I think it's hard for people to wrap their heads around what that, what does that actually look like? I think that your project is decolonizing in progress, right? But so I have two related questions. One is like, what does that look like on a personal level, especially if you are not of indigenous heritage? Well, I suppose I wanna hear both sides of that story, right? What, what does it look like if you didn't always know that that was something that needed to happen <laughs> and now you do? What does that look like on a personal level? And also what does the future look like for Strawberry Bank? I mean, we saw there may once again be a title inlet, but in a, in a perfect future where this is much more part of our education system, it's much more a part of our general conversation around history and around our modern life. What does that look like in Strawberry Bank's future? I know that's a lot. But. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the most important places to start um, with, with that idea and the idea of decolonization is for everybody to recognize that although history has already happened, um, our interpretation of history and the stories we hear about history are not set in stone. Um, I think the conversation about decolonization has really um, been highlighted this summer when there was a lot of movement toward removing harmful relics of um, the Confederacy or that celebrated um, slave owners. And, you know, people being like, oh, you can't, you can't erase history. You can't rewrite history. And to those people, I say, rewriting history is literally my job. As an archaeologist, if I don't go out and find something new that tells us something new about the past, 
what's the point? <laughs> um, so I think entering a mindset where we realize that, that um, the one narrative that we were presented of history from um, colonial documents is one-sided and that it's fragile and that it's um, editable is really important. And so for individual people to begin to, um, I think just introduce more diverse lines of thinking, you know, even into the fiction you read, read more fiction um, by indigenous authors or by um, people of color, um, like hear from more languages, more, uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think that for the museum's future, I think that we're working on more diversity and more uh, facets of history and storytelling into all of our upcoming exhibits, um, which could be like another whole presentation, other exhibits planned at the museum. Um, I forget the other parts of your question. So let me uh, let I'm going to jump more. in for just a moment too. You know, this, this um, argument we hear about you, you taking down statues or changing names of places or without you, you can't erase history. Um, is taking a very simplistic view. Um, there's a difference between acquiring new knowledge, acquiring new perspectives, um, and picking and choosing that which we want to celebrate, um, or at least being informed about who we are honoring and who we are celebrating. You know, those are two different things. You know, so to change uh, a statue or what have you, I, I, you begin to get into this area where we don't know what we don't know yet. And there does need to be a new, pers new more information brought forward. And just, you know, there's that, there's that uh, adage that winners write the history. <laughs> It doesn't necessarily mean they were winners. It could have just meant they were better armed or what have you. Like, it does that winners and losers implies something that's too polarized to represent reality, which is that people intermingled and in, intermixed and had impact on one another and that that goes on. And to learn about history and learn more about stories that are less often told enriches us. It doesn't negate someone else's history. It just fills the picture out more entirely. I love that, thank you. Well, is there anything else you you both wanted to say before we- Actually, I had a question for you. When oh, we were, sure. um, people were asking, uh, how is this presentation gonna be available? All right. Yeah, Hari, is there like a particular place on the library's website where people can find information either about these Indigenous Stories programs or where you might have a reading list that people could refer to or any resources yeah. that you would like to, to tell us about? So we have, um, the easiest way is to look at our land acknowledgement page because at the bottom of that page, um, which I'll share in the chat, we have a link to an Indigenous Stories resources page, and I would love for Anne and Alex you to take another look at it and see if there's anything I'm missing, because I think I need to collect some stuff from our past couple of events when a lot more was shared. Um, but that also has a resources page that has all of our partner organizations, um, I've just shared it in the chat, um, book list that we've created, both nonfiction and fiction for adults, and book list for kids, which Anne, you helped us to populate as well um, after your storytelling event. Oh, yeah. Um, and some other information about um, land acknowledgements in general. So um, with obviously links to Strawberry Terrific. Bank. So. so you just put that, the link to that in the, in the chat. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And I, I, I want to give a shout out at this point to, we are currently doing a reading challenge um, where you can sign up online and try to complete this challenge. And it's called the Read Woke Challenge. It's an international movement um, but so that we've just joined up with um, but basically the aim is to read one narrative from either an author or about a character preferably both um, from a number of different um, underrepresented populations and one is indigenous stories um, so I encourage everyone to check that out because it's a really nice way to diversify your reading list you know voices of women voices of people experiencing homelessness and poverty african-american voices things like that so um, I will also share a link to that momentarily in the chat, but thank you for asking. Well, thank you so much for inviting Alex and I to yeah, thank you. share this 
presentation this evening. It's been, um, you know, an honor, and I, I'm delighted how many people were able to attend. Um, and hello to people I saw who came in. But I, I'm no good at the chat thing, so hi everybody. I saw your names as you were coming in. Glad you could be here with us tonight. 